Um, I work on a new type of blockchain called Tupelo. I'm going to be chatting about uh, how that works with IPFS um, downstairs at 2.30. Uh, so I won't get into it too much more now. I'm Brian. I'm with Cryptorado, I guess. Um, people talk about our Cryptorado node. And I'm mostly just interested in stuff like that, trying to get us off these centralized services and system friendship. I'm Eric. I uh, work for uh, Clear B and Clear Checks, and uh, basically we do uh, we're a startup. We do background um, checks, but we're trying to position ourselves via a uh, trust node and, uh, to decentralize uh, some sovereign identity space. Cool. So, question: Because we have so many people interested, let's go down the hall to a much bigger space so we can, we can do a bigger round table. I like the sound. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Let's go. Cool. Let's go. We are still live. You want to keep this here? You can't keep it. Of course, I kind of want to take notes of this. So, yes, please. And we we'll set up live streams so that we got this. In fact, do you, I should have said it earlier. We could have set up a live call. On Thank you. 
Talks just say I've already talked to them. I think I was the last one. Okay. Let's start with you. Hey, so my name is Rohit, and I'm coming from India. And uh, I'm an undergraduate student doing my computer science uh, degree at a university called SRM University. And uh, I work on blockchain technology and uh, machine learning technology. And I've also some experience uh, working on many projects related to blockchain and IPFS. Yeah, so that's what. Yeah, for those of you that they're just kind of say who you are, what you do, and what you're able to talk about here. So, uh, just like who you are, um, you know, who you work for, what, or what you do, um, and then you know what you're helping to learn here. <laughs> Hi everyone, uh, I'm Vishnu Mitra, and I'm from the same university as. What So even I'm that developer and. Uh, I work a bit on IPFS, so I'm here to work on that. Cool. Yeah, I'm Marka. I'm like uh, from the same university and also have been to UT Berkeley, California, like first semester. And my main focus of it, I mean, I'm like a blockchain researcher, and my area focus is like, uh, like every Hi everyone, I'm Shri Ram, I'm from the same university. So I'm here to learn more about the papers, and I'm working on the blockchain. Great, I'm a doctor, I'm a business guy. <laughs> I know what you're doing. Yep, he's good, I think. Um, hey, I'm Evgeny, uh, from, uh, we're working on the computer engineering project. And we obviously, uh, the papers know about my papers. Did you say Fuse Labs? Or? Oh, fluids. I am just an anonymous person. I <laughs> learned about decentralized network. Perfect. That works. <laughs> I'm Alexander. Uh, I work for a Bitcoin company, but I'm a fan of all decentralized encryption technologies. I'm Harrison. I uh, work on decentralized content address protocols. Not exactly at DFS, but uh, work, you know, see what the summary block is that uh, trying to. Future direction. I'm Dylan, and I'm uh, also just here to learn more about the intricacies of uh, decentralized protocols. Hi, everyone. I did too. Also, uh, hey, my name is Keith Canella, and I work on a this project for Protocol Labs. I'm here to learn about all what you are able to learn about. Uh, problems you're having, what you're trying to build, uh, you know, what uh, experiments you've had so far. Uh, Carson, I'm a textile. Um, we build uh, developer tools on top of IPFS. And um, so I think I'm here to learn what issues people have building on top of IPFS so we can help to uh, use that a little bit, but also um, you have some opinions about things that can the community as a whole can gather around. So share those as well. Hey everyone, uh, I'm Josh Hudson. I'm a DevOps engineer and software developer. Um, I don't work for a Web3 company right now, but I would like to. So, um, here networking and building skills. Hello everyone, I'm Salim Makune. I'm a software engineer. And I know nothing about decentralized stuff or blockchain, so I'm here just to catch up with the things happening in the world. This is Althea. <laughs> Hi, I'm Dr. And uh, she's pretty much Althea. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we build decentralized uh, internet service providers, um, the router, cable, and the bandwidth. 
partner and add capacity to the network in a seamless way. That's true. Yeah, so I have to transfer one more And uh, I, I am uh, an emerging standards engineer, but I also have a lot of knowledge of infrastructure. And I'm here today to uh, find out what all the business guys are interested in um, and uh, disclose that what I'm focused on and why I'm here this weekend is to understand how uh, architecturally DAO and other kinds of applications like IPFS um, can be integrated into real world infrastructure scenarios. Um, most of that happens here though. I'm just trying to learn. Thanks. What's your name? Dan. Daniel A U. Uh, oh that's that's good. <laughs> Let's go. Yeah, I'm Eric again. Oh, here we went. Trust the perfect. Yeah, you trust the guy. Who's the one? Who's the one? I have Ian, a uh, working collaborator. It's a um, data verification for first responders. Awesome. Cool. Uh, and then um, <clears throat> my name is Matt. Uh, I am with Pinata. And we basically are trying to make tools and Hosting services for people that are working with IPFS. We want to make it easier for you, more stable, more fast, the fun stuff that you guys probably want. Um, so I, we've learned a lot from our work. Uh, I know you guys at Textile certainly have, and I'm sure there's a lot of you guys have also learned a lot from your work on IPFS. There's probably some people here that are just going to learn. There's probably some people here that are more advanced. Uh, this is really a kind of a free forum. So I want, you know, whatever ideas you want to talk about. Nothing's really off limits. Uh, I guess we're going to start off with just to lead the discussion. Uh, those of you that are kind of just starting to get into IPFS, uh, I know when I first started, it was a little bit of a tricky space. For those of you that are in that scenario, is there anything that's been bugging you? Anything that you've been struggling with? Uh, open the floor. I'll go. Um, so for the thing that I'm going to be demoing in my presentation today, downstairs at 30. Um, the, the core part of it that already existed that I kind of built on was already this uh, JavaScript web app. Um, so it was really just you know, static files posted somewhere. And it was on GitHub pages, but I thought I can't, I can't present this at this uh, summit until it's posted on like, yeah, that's fun. Um, so just as kind of like a, I don't know, a user story of moving something over to IPFS, um, the pieces that I ended up using were um, Let's see, I found, I'm trying to think who I found this from now. Maybe it was just in Shipyard. But um, like an IPFS deploy uh, script, or maybe it was already a GitHub action. I either, I played with a few, but I got an IPFS deploy GitHub action in there to kind of replace the one that was deploying in GitHub pages. And that then I talked to Pinata to pin it after it added the new content. That worked great, so kudos to you all. Um, and then it also talked to uh, Cloudflare to update the DNS link to the new patch. And the Cloudflare piece was really nice because this app already did like, if you're not, if it's not being served over HTTPS, it tries to redirect you to that because it needs to be on the HTTPS. Um, the thing I ran into was that Cloudflare seemed like it was about the only um, like gateway out there that would just automatically give you that auto, like let's encrypt serve. Uh, sitting in front of it, um, but I don't want to rag on them because it's cool that they have an IPFS gateway. IPFS gateway is really late. Like, I, I pinned the shit out of all kinds of stuff on servers that are like super online, and like, I don't know, a good 10% of the time, top players gateway can't find it. And Yadas can find it, IPFS IO can find it. So that's kind of where things got really tricky. And I had a big I can't remember for maybe by for a little insight there. Uh -huh. Yeah. I mean, Cloudflare may be a company with a name like Cloudflare, but if you were to look at it virtually, it's just think of a big red target that everybody's trying to get. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, it could, it could be that. I I opened a ticket with them, but they were basically like, Yeah, you're on the free tier, so we'll get back to you sometime next decade. Mm -hmm. Um but you know, the first the tier one person was like, Yeah, I don't know what's going on, so at least it wasn't something to I guess. But the thing, the thing I ended up using, because uh, this thing I'm going to demo later, which will hopefully still be successful, the demo gods are shining on me today. Um, one of the large files that it has to download to 
off of IPFS was consistently not working uh, through the gateway. And I actually put in the uh, IPFS shipyard uh, service worker note uh, because this was being lazily loaded anyway. So it was easy to load it after I could fire up that service worker and everything. And that worked great. That just fixed it. So that was really cool to see the web app become like a, a full, or you know, maybe not a full node, but more of a node on the network rather than using the gateway. So that was pretty cool. So I'd like to see that like get worked on somewhere too. Yeah, maybe you're sitting uh, timeouts for the criteria. There's a lot of files. Did the service worker make the same request for the same server for the same file? Sorry, what's that? Wouldn't the server worker, service worker make the same request the same URL for the same file? Well, no, so my understanding was that the way the service worker worked is any, any URL that started with slash IPFS slash hash, it intercepted and it acted like an IPFS node to actually go and say, like, okay. PhD, where can I get this from? Yeah, I might proxy through a bunch of other peers, but sure. Yeah, it, it, it opens a bunch of web socket connections. Yeah, that's 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 failed. Yeah, that's wild. But it fixed it. So oh, actually putting your decentralized code in the most decentralized place. Yeah. yeah. So that was really cool. So anyway, yeah. Decentralization good. <laughs> I would love to see fix it, or uh, someone else got the like that really nice automatic let's encrypt gateway. Going, I would switch to that. Yeah. A little bit back on that. So, Cloudflare can do that just because they're Cloudflare. They're massive and have you know, 150 data centers around the world. They're, they basically write rules for a lot of the internet. Um, so, yeah, I'd like to see that other companies too. But, yeah, right now they're the kind of the big boys there. Um, their gateway is kind of a massive target for a lot of companies, which might explain some of the issues you've had. Yeah. Um, there's been a few. Issues they've had with people streaming petabytes of data through them, which falls just a little bit in the abuse category. So they've, they've taken steps to mitigate some of that, but yeah, they're still working on it for sure. Yeah. So, yeah, uh, like you said, I can deploy a great tool. I think a lot of people have kind of started the use of it in the industry. For those of you who are just getting started, I mean, have a lot of you played around with building the website? How did you get started? Uh, in this space, like what, what was the first thing you played around with? Your first kind of experience? Don't be shy. I think you're probably the I give us the CMI and like sharing fight <laughs> Gotcha. Gotcha. Um, okay, so the IPFS CLI, which probably means a lot of you guys are starting off hosting things locally. Uh, Great place to start. I know when I first did that, there was a little bit of a transition from running locally to out of a server. Oh boy, things aren't really as performing as I thought they would be. You know, there's a lot of gotchas there. Have any of you guys experienced stuff like that? Is there anything that wasn't quite working the way you thought it was when you made that transition? Or if you didn't make that transition at all, why was that? I, I have never gotten an IPMS to work once. It does do whatever it is, name, add, whatever, and it doesn't return. Yeah. Okay. So that's been a big thing for me. So I like your reason. Yeah. Um, I don't know what the conversation is. <laughs> so one thing that's really nice about like the we run a local like it's just good to share like files. It's so much easier to like understand how it works than if you were using a part of the plan and you want to just wait share by the part. Because in, in the torrent system, you can create creative torrent, you need to upload that as like uh, trackers to them, and that because you don't need any of that. So it's like so much more convenient. Okay. Yeah, that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, you know, trackers, some of that BitTorrent has got utilized to find content with IPFS. Uh, not exactly needed. Well, you could build IPFS trackers if you want to to help find content easier. So. If anyone is competing in Denver this weekend, there's a hackathon idea for you. Uh, yeah, so I guess the people that are kind of starting new, a lot of you seem a little shy. Uh, those of you that are actually working with IPFS in production, anything that you'd like to see, uh, anything that's been bugging you lately, could be super intricate, could be you know as broad as you want. We have a lot of time here, so uh, really I want this to be an open floor. 
I'm kind of curious in that for, for the people that are shipping in production, like what are the biggest missing pieces still? You know, like I, I've been asked like with ES and, and Unstoppable Domain, we're seeing a really lot of activity around naming and name resolution. And you know, the, the ES is still like where most of the status, uh, status quo where hangs off of how all of the infrastructure works. How big are things like naming in terms of a feature gap or a, or a blocker on what you're trying to do? I think IPNS specifically, for me anyway, it's pretty big because now if I want to put a new version of my site, I can generate an IPFS hash. And I have to go to my DNS, which is now outside of the centralized web. If you want to that way. Um, whereas if IPNS did work for me, I can just update my IPNS. All of my work that I'm doing stays within this decentralized web space. And then my DNS, I think, just happens to point to IPNS. But I don't have to like, think about it or about it. So it's just like that. I feel like I was. I want to be totally centralized, but I can't quite be. So I have to go back to that comment. <laughs> so uh, I'm just going to jump in for a second and mention the following. I haven't I haven't heard anything but um, issues with interoperability, if you will. Interoperability is uh, something that I'm very interested in. Uh, and this goes to uh, you know, DAOs and you know, uh, distributed file systems, and how those things work across supply chains and across different kinds of infrastructure that are geographically diverse. Those are really important topics for the sort of existing infrastructure world. How do you take something that's legacy and how do you start creating interoperability of, around the pieces? mentioned DNS. Um, it's a very uh, great endemic problem. Uh, it's a great interoperability uh, challenge. Sorry to interrupt guys, there's an iExec workshop or a presentation going on downstairs. If anybody who's interested, that's happening now. So here's my comment on the IPNS thing because I think so like in IPNS we have this like way of that content, the IPNS is like thought of, of like a way to like get dynamic pointers. So to me like it, it seems like the IPNS community like is putting too much faith in IPNS, at least that's it's very preconceived because like the thing you can do with this is you have like public keys and then point to that uh, but that's not really enough to create like a decent like naming system because like the keys are gonna end up like in colon or like lost. You need some way to like change up the keys, like rotate them, and, like basically have a uh, more dynamic way of like assigning a name to uh, something. So like I don't know if there's like a larger mission in that business that's like not being like publicly available anymore. Uh, but but that seems like as it's currently conceived, I don't see like that you would like get a lot of benefits even if it's like fast. Yeah, I mean, just to sort of second that point, I think, I mean, our team, we generate a lot of IPFS hashes as part of our thread support call. And there's almost no situation where we actually really need IPNS uh, in order to manage dynamic data because. Um, there are other protocols available. I mean, if you want a DNS thing, that's great. If you want to use IPNS, use it, but don't rely on it. Um, and I think the, the big piece of it is just because, you know, we're trying to shoehorn uh, something to, to match to kind of how the web works now. But like modifying hashes, that's going to be something we're just going to have to deal with. And we have to come up with like more clever solutions to that. One of the, thing, one of the things that Textile does and I'm not suggesting this is what you know everybody needs to do, but it's just like how we think about it is that um, you can develop other protocols and other multi-address systems that are dynamic, that are, are a fixed value that point to you know hashes in a different way than IPNS. Um, that require maybe more trust than IPNS does. But if you're going to you know myawesomesite.com. Anyway, like by gateways and stuff like that, you are implicitly trusting. You're implicitly trusting anyway. So maybe, you know, in certain situations that trust is okay. In other situations where you don't want to trust, 
an individual node, but the network as a whole, then you, know, you can fall back to IPNS. So I think the web, web 2 now already sort of has a lot of fallbacks built in, right? Well, I went to HTTP, uh, but I really want you to go to HTTPS, but I'll fall back to HTTP if you, you know, like there's all of these fallbacks that we already use, so we shouldn't really assume that, you know, we're not also going to have that in the framework. So, yeah, IPNS is slow. A, it's not always going to be slow. There's lots of very smart people who want to make it faster. B, maybe it's not always the thing you want, actually. Maybe right now DNS is what you want. Uh, or maybe right now, like, off-band sharing of a hash is actually what you want. Or like a separate protocol, like PubSub, where you just subscribe to something, and that's actually pretty good. And if you don't get every single update every single time, that's OK, because eventually you'll get the latest. So there's a lot of other situations and that like our team is built on the assumption that like one of those things isn't gonna work, but some of those things are gonna work and then so just you know, building in callbacks and things like that. And if uh, this is something that you're interested in, my presentation at 30 is about exactly this of uh, using Tubelo to create um, trustable, decentralized, like human friendly or your application friendly mutable pointers into IPFS content. Cool. I think, I think that's, a, that's a really interesting point as well. That the use case of the user at the point of initiating that interaction might affect the trust level that's required. So if, depending on the content they're accessing, maybe if, if not, there will not be one name resolution mechanism to rule them all. And maybe that's one that meets your needs at a given time. Yeah, just, just to add to so like from my perspective, so uh, we've been involved in like the uh, decentralized identity community for a long time, and basically the, the, they have a spec called DAD, which is like a way of having an identifier that points to a DAD document, and it's basically a way of bootstrapping trust to uh, identities. So like you have this identifier, uh, you, you resolve a document that contains public keys, so like for uh, signatures, verified signatures, and encryption data to like uh, a specific user. I think a lot of, at least in our view, like a lot of problems with content routing in IPFS can actually be solved by just routing to data through the user that is currently uh, interacting uh, with the network. I, I missed the intro in the other room. What, what's the project? That's three bucks. That's three bucks. So I'm hearing a little bit about you know two companies that. Three, it sounds like actually that uh, I found a problem with IPFS. Um, so IPNS is a big, you know, use case there, but it seems like a lot of the results are on content routing, like you addressed. Um, I'm curious to hear about, you know, if there's anybody out there, you know, what else, what other things in there uh, in IPFS have you guys encountered that you have, you know, created your own solutions for? IPFS didn't do something the way you wanted it to or you didn't expect it to. So you as a company or developer said, okay, I'm gonna take this in my own hands and kind of create something a little more custom to make it work how we want it to. Yeah, so um, we, we haven't done it yet, but like we had, we had the process. So we have we had a lot of issues with IPFS and I don't uh, about them already. We use data propagation, we spend with consumption. Uh, like it's pretty much a typical problem as far as I understand. So like, the use case is very simple. It's simple. We upload data on one node and one for two from another node. Okay, so now we, we gotta wait 10 minutes or whatever time. Uh, and uh, the, the nodes themselves are um, might not be really stable. Uh, they, they, start eating all the values uh, and uh, that's that's probably because of i don't know it's more interpretation something like that. uh so like we end up not using ipfs at all we end up implementing our own pht our own um, solution for uh values optimization like that's something like that. Uh, access control uh, stuff based on, on certificates in, in the network to prioritize to allow nodes to prioritize traffic. And on, on IPFS, you cannot prioritize traffic uh, to 
you know, kind of from theories you know, and you don't you just observe them all. Um, so, but like, did you told me that there is a whole time, like, you told me you uh, better at that. Uh, yeah. So, like, there is a whole team at IPFS that dedicated to solve this basic data propagation problem. It's got to be solved. Yeah, so I mean, if, if you were here this morning when Molly did her talk, the first half of 2020, basically a chunk of the IPFS team has cleaved off from the core to be able to focus on exactly that kind of problem. So we were talking about it last night. Molly talked a little bit about it and also published it in uh, on the IPFS blog uh, a couple of days ago, which is uh, IPFS plans for, for 2020. And this, this problem where you have two disparate nodes and one's hosting the CID and the other requests the CID. And there's very little visibility into kind of what the mechanisms and how exactly that routing for a request for that content happens. Uh, and there's a lot of like, potential performance problems there in those, those, those two actions on top of each other. Uh, this still fixes at the DHC, capability implementation level, some other stuff that's happening at uh, liquidity and network stack level. But you know, the goal is to really close that gap as soon as possible. Because it really is like it's the number one, number one thing that came back after things like FPFS came. We talked to a bunch of different people that are using IPFS, and over the, you know, the last half of 2019, um, we solved a bunch of stability problems with IPFS, and then you know, issues like this, you know, we have time and resources to be able to focus on the deeper level changes that need to happen to close that gap. But content resolution is, is by far the number one priority for the project right now. I've got a question about you about this whole routing issue that happened to me yesterday. So I started, I started running my node um, on Ubuntu at home and I'm on uh, Comcast Internet Xfinity. Uh, and basically, my node was running, and then all of a sudden, um, I, I pinned, I don't know, like six files and built this project. It's all working kind of cool, and I was like, this is sweet. I was pretty impressed by how it's going. And then my phone started blowing up, and uh, Xfinity was like, you're getting attacked. And uh, and I was like, what? And I started looking. It's like coming from port four thousand one, and I'm like, okay. And I'm getting all these hits from China, and it's showing all. And I mean, I mean, they, I, it's, I got two hundred and twenty warnings from Xfinity that I've been attacked. I'm on a clean Ubuntu instance. There's nothing fishy on my machine, and it's just because my IPFS node was, I guess. I don't know that I'm being attacked. I just have a port that's open, and it's I'm creating built up a peer list. Yeah, like with China, and apparently Comcast thought that was really efficient behavior. And I don't know they're blocking it. I'm just, I just, it totally happened. And you guys are just talking about this whole routing issue, and I'm like, I'm, my, you know, my IP is getting blown up by you know, the fact that I'm getting, and they're saying I'm being attacked. Like, and I don't think. It's a vector for anybody there. You, you could tweet one of their one of their automated bots and just to text like too many requests to get the or something. Yeah, apparently all of a sudden now I'm just some weird you know that's getting all these requests from China and they don't have too much to You shouldn't be answering tons of DHT queries unless you actually have something that everybody's asking for. Well you have like the yeah, first files that you can in that are like the you know, yeah, I can only assume that there's like you that's an attack if there is now. So it's, that's very strange. I mean, sometimes I I get best notes on clients is like port mapping and stuff like that. And on like uh, uh, you know, if you're running one in the cloud or something, but that's crazy. I have a whole blog. They sent me a whole blog on every IP address to check. Can I give you my email address? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> you wanna, I mean, it was a super weird problem, and it kind of freaked me out. And I was like, well, obviously, this is an IPS test problem, but I don't know what's happening. Um, and I didn't actually think I was exposing myself to it. <laughs> was it classified NSA documents that you were seeing? <laughs> 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 I mean, it was all encrypted and hacked. Did you pin some big memes, some really popular content? Because they My logo? <laughs> 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 it, was it was a PDF of my buddy's book cover. It was a really great book, but he's not selling that much on Amazon. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually what I'm doing here. I'm building a decentralized marketplace for eBooks. So it's, it's cool, but I'm not sure. I, I would say, too, like, if, if the log's clean and there's no PII in there at all, um, feel free to just post it to a bug in the IPFS repo, the code IPFS repo. Yeah. Uh, but if there is, if you're worried that there is identifiable information, right. feel free to share it with me, and then when they're clean, I'll share it with somebody on the core team. 
Yeah, let me see what Xfinity gives me because they were like, I mean, I was getting my phone was blown up. They're like, you're getting attacked by China. Like, blah, blah, blah. I'm like, no, I don't think that's what's happening. <laughs> Where did your distro come from? I mean, where did you come from? Oh, IPS? No, I was talking about the Ubuntu. Uh, my brother ooh, put it on there. Ooh, yeah, that's right. I <laughs> <laughs> Just now. I mean, I'm assuming you probably got it. ISOs for you. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. Not seen it. Let me, oh yeah, I'll look up with it. See if I can find some sort of data. Interesting. Here. Yeah. It was super weird. Right? The log, yeah, the log would be a great entry point to spelunking that problem. Sure. Yeah, for those of you that aren't aware, IPFS can be very, very, very chatty. So you'll get a lot of requests from the network. And it may just be peers that we're looking to connect to yours. You know, expand their own peer luster. I know what it seemed like was happening. And it was, it was from all over the world. There was a lot of Chinese activity. And, and I don't know whether that was China like some people are sitting in there. But there's a lot of them from America, too. Um, and it's another weird problem because, like, we use up all of our data because I have a couple kids and they want to watch four kid videos all day long. And so I'm like, oh, great. I have my head to be a best now. I'm like, how much am I going to pay for this? <laughs> I'm definitely nervous about that. You know? That's oh. a big problem. Because I was, yeah, huge, huge activity. So back a little bit on content routing. Uh, so you mentioned like your use case where you spin up a node, you upload some data to it, and uh, you know you get another node, can't find it, it takes 10 minutes to find it. Um, this is actually something that we dealt with a lot early on, kind of between our host nodes and our gateway nodes. Um, and the simple rule that we found here, you got a few blog posts on this, but basically just if you connect your nodes, you have swarm connect them. Um, the content discovery process is very instant. So one, the requester node asks, you know, it's peerless, hey, does anybody know who has the data? If the hosting node is one of those peers, it's just going to instantly like, respond back, hey, I've had this data, and it's going to send it out. Um, there's a few kind of like hacky ways you can do this. You can set up scripts to manually connect them if there are two nodes that are always going to be online. Um, let's say you have peer, or say you have users out in the world somewhere. Um, then you consider bootstrapping those nodes to your host nodes when they first come online. It's just kind of the initial setup process. It's an easy way to do it. Um, yeah, the golden rule there is if two nodes are connected, content discovery should be instant. I just want to highlight this. I mean, Matt mentioned there's like sort of hacky ways to do it, but I would argue that's not a hacky way at all. That's perfectly reasonable. You're using like uh, semantic sort of like network information like social connections or social interactions to improve your like technical connections. So like again, I'll use textiles as an example, we do a lot of stuff with like sharing files between peers. And we use the fact that like two peers know each other in you know IRL just to assume like look if I know you and I've shared a file with you before, probably I should ask you first before asking the DHT. Uh, if you've got what I want, because probably you do, because I, I literally just shared a file with you. So I would argue it's not a hack at all, but I actually just think it's a good idea. Yeah, that, that comes from more of my desire to see there's a, there's a, there's a post out on GitHub somewhere in the new IPFS repo where like, Juan's talking about like IPFS friend lists. Uh, there might be a different term for it that he uses, but basically where you can configure a group of peers that you always want to remain connected to. And if both peers have that same friend list, um, they'll maintain connected without having to run like special scripts or anything. So I don't know how much sweat you have. I guess that's not to be tracked with. That's uh, that's something that I would definitely like to see. But, but that's also like it might work in some cases, but in some cases you don't. You might not know like which IPFS peer you're on. You like have like you want access to your content, but now you're like. For some reason, you're on a different like because you know, like you might, might be in a browser, or JS node, or you might be on the code. Yeah. So those that those might be different, but you still want to access the same data. You don't necessarily know before. That's a great point. Um, so that is something that you know that the DH content fix as well will help fix some of the five ships. Um, in the meantime, I guess it's not a thing we have a lot of us on, but uh, one thing we, we've looked into a little bit is kind of from like a theory side is uh, we, we call them like dedicated networks 
it's just kind of a marketing term we came up with, to be quite frank. But uh, basically, IPFS has this cool feature of private networks where you can you know, basically set up a network that only people who have the same private key can connect to each other. And uh, if you don't need your content to necessarily be found on a public IPFS network, it's a good solution for a lot of these because their nodes are all going to connect to each other just because there's not as many of them. IPFS would be used to maintain a few thousand connections at a time. It's not super hard. Is that, is that like a, a big rate you have when you dedicate the node? Yeah, it's one of the, I think, experimental features of. I'm uh, sorry. I'm You do a lot more than that. I'm sorry. I think it's on GitHub if you just search IPFS private networks. Uh, on that same note, though, let's say you don't need the content to be private, you just don't want to be able to have a shatter of the main network. You can still utilize that same functionality, but just make that private key public. You could expose it to on GitHub or wherever. And then let's say you only want a network of nodes that care about three box data or textile data or you know, whatever company you have. Um, it's kind of like a makeshift network sharding functionality that we found in the meantime when we kind of wait for IPFS to continue to progress to come to that layer. Yeah. So you kind of form your own little network of specialized nodes and only care about content that they should, you know, they should be dealing with. You don't have to deal with a decentralized exchanges data that's spamming you all day. You can just deal with three box data. And then the cool thing is once you know IPFS continues to progress, I think it's to a point where the public network has near instantaneous content routing. You can just flip the switch on those nodes and put it right back to the public network and no data is lost. This actually is like really close to an issue that I, I like, care a lot about. But this, like, so I, I think there's been talk about like something like all keys in IPFS, where you can share some CAEs with, with some peers, but not like all peers. And then you have like mm -hmm. public CAEs, and like basically like a, to make it more server based access. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't know if that's just what that is. Like, that's something that would be like really nice if I want. Have some remote here to hold my data, but only share it with like me and maybe a friend. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I think Carson's company has actually done a little bit of work in this area. Well, we have, but I actually uh, wasn't going to mention that. I was going to ask a question about. So, the, with the private network, effectively, all you're doing is just not announcing, republishing the DHT information to anyone outside of that. That doesn't have that key, but the data itself added. To, so if you switched off that key the next time you restarted your node, you would just be a normal IPFS that doesn't like encrypt the data or anything. Like that. Yep, that's correct. So yeah, so some of you that your peer had some content, they could still route directly to you. If they had your, you know, yep, that's correct. Yeah, so. Um, they behave the same way. The hash algorithm is the same. You send data to the node, regardless of whether it's a private or a public node. So it's just, just, that's just sort of a P2P, the libp layer of like which nodes are connected. Yep, it's it's purely a libp thing. That's what it is. That's yeah, that's a great point. So what was the marketing name? Uh, we call them dedicated networks. We didn't. I, yeah, we, we didn't want to be like public private IPFS networks. It sounded a little confusing. We like the word dedicated because it kind of signified, uh, you know, all the nodes care about just a certain set of data. And whether they're a private network or public, it doesn't really matter. The point is they're kind of specialized. Yeah. I wish we would have chosen a different term for other reasons, but yeah, that's what we have right now. Uh, yeah. Anybody else got anything that's on their mind? That comes kind of for I we, I got here a little late uh, and didn't know what the schedule was. I just missed the talk uh, that Peter uh, gave. Uh, I I don't know what like the broad strokes of you're focusing on content routing. Like, are there any strategies in mind that you're like really thinking about deeply, or that you're probably going to target these that like, like lowering the boots first, or what's the like the strategy? Right? So I I don't, I'm not on the team, so I don't have a ton of detail about it. Been trying to slightly keep up, yeah. Uh, but I think all that, like, there, but there's a bunch of already issues that are filed that that the Go IPFS core team has been getting to a for a while. But that's there, there are a few, I think, even Go IPFS 0.5, which 
Is it going to come out later this quarter? I think. It would well, repo shows like yes. Go ahead. Go to Dash IPFS. Oh, yeah. And I think that will have some of the fixes already. Okay. And they, I think they, they pushed back that release a little bit to be able to get some of these fixes into it. Uh, but I think beyond that, they're, they're looking at a whole bunch of different things. There's like a, a, a best research group as well. So they're looking at what are alternate alternatives to the DHC. Uh, all types of different, like, like how can we make the, kind of the, the I'll put all the solutions on the table. Yeah. And the, kind of like the conversation we've been having here where sometimes that single architecture is maybe not the right match for a given use case. And this you know, conversation about dedicated or private networks, uh, where, and, and how you all set up the cafes, is a place where I think the end user need starts to be in form more narrow and more specific use cases, but then affect the architecture on how I think that's case to be built. And you know, one of the one of the conversations too, you know, you talk about friends list, and I think the core team, the question ends up being from a standardization point of view and interoperability point of view, like how how fast do you want to make the protocol? How lean, how do we make the protocol? What are the characteristics? Of protocols like HTTP that have already got us like a good three decades or more. Uh, how do we how do we design a PNP and distributed network architecture that will get us that you know to, to more decades than that? And a way that that folds in what we learn from HTTP, but moving forward. And I think like for me, just to zoom out, when we ask these types of questions, you know, we can solve these problems we have today, but it's really important to to step back and look at the the, the what are the academic learnings that have happened so far. Like um, you know, uh, name name networking, NDN and stuff like that. Like, there's a, a whole bunch of work that's been done in this area um, that maybe we can learn from. And I think they're looking at it like, what what is what is plumbable architecture like from a contract standpoint is one of the questions that I see. So not being overly prescriptive, not you know moving fast, not trying to mitigate the problem for now, but also being really open to what are alternative network architectures that we can look at that might really get us to that that, that long haul. Yes. I think that's really is it. Like we're all rushing forward and building things right now, but it's at 0.5, and and you know the, the philosophy of PL in in IPFS and Pop and all these projects is to think about that longer term and that longer time longer vision. Like what's what's the 10 year view? What's the 50 year view? What are the characteristics of protocols that have gotten the internet this far today, and what can we learn from the mistakes that were made as well? I think another thing that our team. Sort of like forcing ourselves to think about when it comes to IPFS is like, you know, if you compare it to other protocols, right? Like it's a protocol, IPFS is a protocol. If you compare it to like HTTP, like every now and then I'm like, oh, why does IPFS do this? And then I'm like, well, wait a minute, why would, why the heck would IPFS do that? Like HTTP doesn't like manage identity for me, right? So why would a decentralized data communication protocol manage identity for me? Does, does make sense? So we have to keep remembering that like. There is an app called IPFS on the command line that you can use, but like ultimately, what I should be expecting from IPFS is like a protocol that does a thing, it's pretty darn good, and you know, there's no to be on there. So. But like ultimately, I need to deal with the identity and the flow, I need, to, I need to deal with, you know, this, that, and the thing. Because there's an entire, many, many industries that are built up around HTTP basically. Using this like low level protocol, and there's all these layers built on top. And right now, we're like at IPFS, maybe like a few little things built on top, and we've still got like several decades of abstractions that need to be built. Um, and I'm going to talk a little bit at the conference about tool building and how it's a slow like, process to start, but like once you start to develop these things. You can then get a lot more creative about what you do with those things. I think we're still at the like IPFS is a protocol, and I shouldn't really be like raising an issue of like, well, your thing doesn't also do backlinks yet. What the heck? You know, it's like, oh, well, maybe I should start a company that builds backlinks on top of IPFS or whatever it is. Um, so like, we constantly have to remind ourselves like, this is a protocol. Or you have to expect protocol type things from. Them. But then we still hang out with people. Labs and say, like, I know you guys are building this protocol, but like, could you also do this? I think it's interesting how you, you know, talk about friends lists for routing, but then you think that identity should be tied in status at that low level, even though, like, it would really help in the routing space. I think they should be separate issues. Yeah, well, I mean, like, so there's difference between, like, I think the peer ID and, like, identity that actually, like, it connects with, right? 
and like Joel mentioned, I, I have multiple IPFS peers that I'm cursing the person who uses, but I could be on a different one at any given time. And so like my identity maybe links my peers together, just like I have a different browser with an account, uh, like a, a Firefox account that I use with different, uh, you know, different devices. It's the same idea, but like IPFS is not going to, you know, create an identity that links my different IPFS peers. All they care, all I care about is that one peer. So it's like different layers of that stack. I think it's important to, to keep these use cases and user cases in context. So I think like what you described too, where you, you have the same user who has presence on different nodes. Uh, and in this case, they might even have the same person with different identities on different nodes. And the more, I guess the more you um the more the more you optimize by gluing those closer together or bringing them closer together. Some of the benefits around censorship mitigation and anti surveillance and tracking become harder to achieve. So I feel like there's also an unanswered but one of the biggest threats that we have on the status quo of today is omnipresent surveillance. Um, like every mouse movement is tracked. Can, like Canvas is uniquely fingerprinting you as a user. Like all these things like that. You even clock timings. So how do we mitigate that in, in things like FTFS? And that's an area that like you haven't really have really time for yet, right? Like, so when you try to optimize for, like I have this performance problem now, you might be trading away against a like something you want to future proof against from the mitigation standpoint of that type of threat for the user. Uh, Matters that is the project that Molly talked about earlier, which is a like sharing of sensor use inside China project. So I think this is very handy for, the, for that perspective. But from the tracking perspective, it might depending on the level of threat, it might not be the right tool. Yeah, we're not without. Some special configuration to be that out of At the risk of kind of overgeneralizing, I guess, is that one thing that as I kind of came into the community, and I'm guilty of it too, because the draw was ideological, it's like decentralized, decentralized, decentralized. Um, that as a business person kind of coming in made it a little bit easier for me to take a step back and be like, well, how do we actually get to the, this better future place that we want without with a dose of gratitude? Acknowledging those trade-offs, when you talk about DNS and the form you learn from HTTP and all those other things, just reminding yourself that sometimes to get to the decentralized, all those benefits, like you can make a few trade-offs along the way, and make it more accessible to people like you. The, the, the gateway, that the gateway serves that definitely is like this. Gateways are not going away. HTTP is going to be around for. You know, decades more, right? So that gateway, considering a part of the IPFS core is really, really important. This is where so much of the traffic comes through, especially if you have service providers as well. Uh, having, having a single point of failure is, is not ideal. Having fewer, at least, you know, fewer points of failure is better until we, we do make that long term transition. But I think you're right, that's going to be your long term. That transition period will not be short. I guess I have a sort of a newbie question. Is there a virtual machine for IPFS? I mean, if you have a mach yeah. machine infrastructure, a virtual machine infrastructure for a node, and, and is it something that's really easy to set up and tear down? Or is there still a more? I mean, yeah, I think there's, there's both. I've seen people that have pre configured VMs, people, people that have it's all hardware. Well, for what it's worth, the reason I ask that is sort of a standardization question. If, if there's this place where you can develop an infrastructure that's a little more resilient. That you know, same thing you have now, but just uh, you know, backfill it with the realization that cyber is a real factor. Uh, it's a real factor for anything that does communication. Um, and I don't know if you, you guys have any resources that have done this, but you should get somebody in to ethically hack your nodes, sit there and say, "How could I break this?" Uh, I don't know if that's been done with my DFS yet. Sure. Have a Good. And then the last question I wanted to ask uh, for anybody, have you guys ever done bug fest? Literally, you know, with some sort of specific hack that you wanted to build with IPFS, and you're sort of curious to see how well it works across different nodes that you plug into. Uh, just sort of curious if there is even a concept of a bug fest in this kind of a distributed model. So, 
I mean, that, not, that, not that I know of, as far as like, let's spin up different IPFS nodes in two different contexts. GS IPFS, Rust IPFS, Python IPFS, C++ IPFS. Go ahead. Just so you know, this goes to interoperability, uh, platform interoperability, you know, a maturation process, if you want to bother having to do any of this. You know, you were talking about looking long term, those are things, you know, would be great to do. I know it's entrepreneurial. No, uh, I, I use table stakes for something that, that needs to be infrastructure and needs to last that long. Teacher, can now uh, uh, protocol <coughs> process when putting together a test bed for a you know, test suite. And this might become something that's not that pattern. And I believe you guys have a system you're putting together that can spin up tens of thousands of nodes all at once. And, and that's the open source project, too. So that's called test grammar. And that's a project that I, I think they just announced their first official release. And this is a way to be able to model these networks at scale. So when we make a change to say the Bitswap algorithm, how can we spin up 10,000 live nodes and run a series of um, like modeled scenarios with real data in real time and see what breaks? Uh, load uh, testing. Yeah, well, a little bit of load testing, but also more complex scenario testing as well. Uh, and there, and then there, there are a set of uh, interop tests that run in CI for all of us, but it doesn't mean that all the nodes are all the implementations are working there. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Welcome to the party. Uh, so it's two oh five. I think this was scheduled to go to either two or two thirty, I'm not sure. Uh, you, guys, you can definitely go close to two thirty. There's a workshop happening at two oh three that we uh, probably want to be the camera for otherwise. Yeah, and then at 2.30, you have to come watch my presentation. Yeah, there you go. There you go. Uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to end things here. I'm also happy to stick around. You know, if you guys want to continue talking, I think we've had good discussion so far. So. Uh, Thanks for working with us. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, anything else in anybody's mind that they'd like to uh, throw out there? Anything they're struggling with? Yeah. I'm sure that Dietrich while he's still here. Uh, I didn't do the hand 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 I'll be around for the rest of the day. So, perfect. Go back downstairs, get more food, and check out uh, there's near protocol if you're in that room right now. Awesome. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for the discussion, yeah. guys. Talk it out while we're here. No, you would like to show your original But it's also a Oh, the big I'm going to go down to that. Yeah, that's the next one. Yeah. 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 So, the way that we work in our construction, what they try to do is 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 they
So this is an issue we ran into So we had to do a lot of stuff. We had quite a while before the yeah, the term is pretty common so how I describe this area was when Fort Okay, so and then the other one was hosting the order, right? So I ended up giving in this and running like a man looking at it, but um, and I saw there was like Oracle or like database. I think that's compatible with this, but I I actually didn't give it up, but I was trying to think of a way where you can use it for the yeah, so the Oracle uses IP address lines. Because I think they're Oracle. Yeah, sorry, sorry. The Oracle. Yeah, there's also someone who made it in this place for a lot of for a high number. Yeah. Um, so I will say, I will say the concern, though, is kind of I think what you're talking about, which is the garbage collection. We have uh, scale orders or something like that. It's trying to clean that up and give it to the ground. It's challenging. Um, 